Any of you guys remember, um, if you're my age and you went to libraries a lot, they had a series of little books that are about this big and they were biographies of American statesmen, right? In my library at Conway Elementary School and down in San Diego, it covered several of the bookshelves. They were the biographies, again, of every great American. And somehow, at about third grade and fourth grade, I got into those biographies and I read every single one of them. I, I just kind of weird that way. I was fascinated, I remember very clearly, I was fascinated with power. I, I, and as you're going to find out, it, I have not stopped being fascinated with how do people wield power? And that, that's just always fast, fascinated me. Fast forward 15 years, I'm earning my master's degree, and, and, and you would think that my favorite TV program, and it was pretty awesome when this TV program came on. Anybody remember when C-SPAN first came on? Okay, how many of you watched it regularly? Yeah. Um, but, it, but in addition to C-SPAN, here are my favorite TV shows. Hit that next one, right? Okay, these were the TV shows I was watching in the evening when I was taking my coursework in the day because I wasn't really interested in the personal. I was interested in the way these very powerful people wield power. I mean, I would sit there with my wife and I was like, oh, that's crazy that they can just do that. They have that much power and I was just fascinated. These, I mean, these were the shows I was watching. Very embarrassing, but you know. But so in college, they didn't have us watching this. Just let you know at Point Loma and the schools I went to, they had us read other things. For example, I just want to give you a couple examples just because I'm, what I'm going to do this morning, I want to compare the kingdom of Jesus to the kingdoms of this world. Um, one of the books that we had to read was a, a book by the name of uh, Sun Tzu, uh, The Art of War. Hit that right there, The Art of War. And this book remains one of the most influential books in Eastern policy, in warfare. Even in the Western world, people, businesses model their businesses after this guy's book, The Art of War. Uh, negotiations, political, um, all, the whole nine yards here. And if you can't read it, this is, this is one of his theories here. It is the rule in war that if there are 10 times the enemy than you have, if you have 10 times the enemy, you surround them. If you have five times more than your enemy, you attack them. If you have double your enemy, you divide them. If you are equal to the enemy, you engage them. If there are fewer than the enemy, evade them. <laughs> and if you are weaker, you should be able to avoid them. So this is just basically, this is how you do negotiations. This is how you do your, people have built their lives around this guy's strategies. And another book that we had to read was The Prince by Machiavelli. Love his quotes. I'm just going to read a couple quotes because, again, I want you to really get the idea of this is the way the world has operated before Christ. And even up to this day, he who neglects what is done for what ought to be done sooner affects his ruin than his preservation. Crazy. Since love and fear can hardly exist together, if we must choose between them, it's far safer to be feared than loved. This is the way he ruled his people. This is the way a lot of rulers rule their people. Let me throw another one out there. A prince never lacks legitimate reasons to break his promise. Never attempt to win by force what can be won by deception. This is the way the kingdoms of the world operate. This is the way people in power operate. This is the, what Jesus say, you know how the people of the world in power operate. This is how they operate. So here's what I've learned. The mighty kingdoms of the world, they always had an edge. They always had something going on. Either they had Sun Tzu running their wars, you know, or they had the prince running their, their government. Um, but they all had something, either fear, or maybe they had a military, they had iron, they had chariots. Uh, maybe they had roads and law, the Roman government. Maybe they gave a little bit of religious freedom like the Persians did. I mean, every great empire, there was something that, that allowed them to become great. We look at our, our, our empire here. We look at economic opportunity and individual rights. That's kind of what drove our American empire. Um, so every empire, again, has something that kind of gives it its power, gives it its mm, Right? And to all these mighty and crazy great kingdoms, Matthew offers up Jesus' kingdom. Now, it's going to be a comparison, so watch very, very closely. Because it's going to be, it's going to be hard to see at first, right? Um, as a comparison. Now, uh, it goes by many names. Hit that next slide there. Uh, it's called the Sermon on the Mount, right? It's what I'm going to be sharing with you this morning. It's been called the Compendium of Christ's Doctrine, the Magna Carta of the Kingdom, the Manifesto of the King. Again, it goes by many names. You all know it probably as the Sermon on the Mount. And again, most people read it kind of as a... Um, and again, you've probably been encouraged to read it as a personal measuring rod of your own 
personal piety and holiness? Like, do you, do you measure up to the eight or nine of the, of the Beatitudes? But the fact of the matter is, Jesus was saying so much more. These weren't personal attributes. This was the way that his kingdom was going to operate. This is the way that people at all levels of an empire, this is the way from the top to the bottom, this is the way we will operate. I mean, like Jesus, literally, if you look at chapter 5 of Matthew, he gathers his followers and then he sits down. I mean, all the, all the, all the, lit, all the, the, the words being used indicate that he's going to reveal to them the, the, the deepest, most important parts of his kingdom. Like, you can't forget this stuff. You can forget everything else I tell you, but don't forget this stuff. This is the, the gist. This is, this is it. This is everything. Disciples are whipping out their pens and pencils, and he says this, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those that mourn. Blessed are the meek. And I can imagine, so the crowd is like this silent, they're like, you, you're kidding. This, this is going to win the world? This is going to compare with Rome's chariots and their long swords and their phalanx and their military? Th- this? this? I mean, the disciples, I mean, the whole crowd. I mean, at the back of the room, I can already see people sneaking out. Like, you've got to be kidding me. Meekness is going to win the world? It's like, Matthew, Jesus, you, you see where we are right now, right? We don't even control our own land. This is where meekness has gotten us. And you're saying that if we continue to be meek, that we're going to conquer the world? Not according to what's been going on so far. And he continues, and it doesn't get any better. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the poor in heart, pure in heart, excuse me. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are those that are persecuted. And again, at this point, people are they're slipping out back ways every which way. I mean, you've got to be kidding me. Nope, nope, that's what the master said, right? Brokenhearted and the persecuted, yep, yep, that, that, that's, that, that's what he said. This strategy isn't going to win the world. What this strategy is going to get you is a trip to heaven really, really fast, right? You've been waiting to get to heaven, right? Follow this strategy and you will get to heaven really fast. This is what the crowd's thinking. And they've got to be thinking that. This, this, is, this is nuts, Gentleness and humility has gotten us nothing but foreign domination. Now, can you imagine, just, just imagine now, go back to about 64, 65 A.D. Paul is in Rome. Peter's in Rome by this point. Nero's the emperor. A lot of Christians have already been crucified. It is a brutal situation. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you... If you're careful, you don't make it known because you will be dragged out of your house. People are being paid to rat on you that you're a follower of the way. And so you're living in Rome, and all you see around Rome is the persecution of Christians. You see them at night. They're being burned at the stake. You hear, you hear stories of them being taken down to the Colosseum and fed to lions. You, you hear all this crazy, crazy stuff. And you find a family sitting outside of Rome. They're in hiding. They're out in a barn. And can you imagine going and telling them, listen, listen, I I know you're hiding right now. I know your whole world has been turned upside down. You've given up everything. You're hiding out here because if you come in from hiding, you will more than likely die. But let me tell you something. In about 200 years, 250 years, look across Rome and you're going to see a cross on the top of every building. And it's not going to be gross and sick like they're crucifying that many people. The cross is going to represent one man crucified, the man that you're in hiding for. And in 250 short years, meekness and forgiveness and mercy, they're going to win the world. And what you see right now, you're in hiding in about 250 years, your Savior his followers will rule the world. There's no way they could have imagined because they were sitting there, they were ready to die. And yet, could you tell them that, that meekness and forgiveness and mercy and graciousness and generosity, that's gonna defeat every kingdom the world has ever known. And it will last longer than any kingdom that the world has ever known. And that young family, they would have to sit there kind of like what you're sitting there thinking right now, like, you know what, our world, what a mess. 
What a mess. We're going to pray for our world in just a bit. Coronavirus, I mean, it just goes on and on and on and on and on. What I want to drive at this morning is if we step back as Christians, if we stop being Christians, you want to see how bad the world can get. It can get worse. It's been worse. And it's worse like this in a lot of different places in the world, but we're sitting here in a land, in a culture that has been built around the idea that each one of you has value because each one of you was created in the image of God. There are a lot of people in the world that don't buy into that at all. So I just want to take a moment here and just bow our heads. Have we been displaying these traits in our life or have we gone for the power moves in our businesses that we own, in our families, just in the way we operate? How do we operate? Do we operate by kingdom principles or do we operate by the kingdoms of this world? Yeah, promise. There's no reason to keep a promise. I can break a promise whenever I want. But Jesus still loves me. Bow your heads, Father. In our world, we, we need your guidance. We need your light. Father, we need the light of Christians. We need Christians to be salt and light. Because that's what all of these, these beatitudes are really driving at. Father, the world holds up an image of, of power. And you either buy into that, that metaphor, that, that worldview, or we step back from it and we hide from it. And Father, you didn't want us to be either one of those. You wanted us to be in the world, but not of that world. Father, you wanted us to have people come face to face with the attributes of your kingdom and the attributes of the kingdoms of the world history shows us that when that happened very short amount of time the world was turned upside down and the world can still be turned upside down that's what we know and that is the power of your spirit father so we we come to you this morning on (laughs) metaphorically bended knee because we know we can't do this alone by the power of your spirit working through your followers we can get this done Lord, you want to work through us, and what a blessing that is. What a dignity. Father, help us to live up to that. Help us to be a reflection of your glory and your light. That when people see us doing good things, they see you doing good things. Father, we're your hands and feet. You call us to be salt and light. And that's a huge, huge, huge call. But by the power of your spirit, we can do these things. So, Father, this morning we, we confess that we haven't been salt and light. We haven't been merciful. We haven't been forgiving or gracious or generous. But you have. You have been perfectly all those things. And Father, this morning, help us to reflect those values and those character traits that will bring heaven to earth for people here in our world. And then you'll extend that to eternity. (laughs) Father, thank you for everything that you're doing, for the work that you're doing in the lives of the people in this room right now and in the lives of the people that the people in this room know that your love is flowing through these people into the city of Richland and Pasco, West Richland, Kennewick, and all all the surrounding areas. Um, Your kingdom is winning. Lord, help us not to get discouraged. Help us to continue to fight on your side and to continue to call on the power of your spirit because this this is a battle that is being won. It's not in question. Father, thank you for that. Be with us now as we continue to worship, as we come back and dig into your word. Jesus, in your name I pray. Amen. Here's where we are. Here's where we leave ourselves. We're a movement of poor, sad, meek, righteous, merciful, pure, peaceful, persecuted, insulted people waiting for a reward in heaven. Is that who we are? Is that really who we are? 
And yet that, that's a, that, that is just a conclusion that people arrive at when they read through the Beatitudes and they think, wow, that, that's they're just a bunch of sheep waiting to be slaughtered. That's what they are. And Christ said, no, 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 no. No, these, these are the traits that are going to win the world over. All the other kingdoms of the world will bow down to these character traits. Merciful and generosity weaknesses in the ancient world and Christ said no 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 these are going to be the things that are going to win the world hard to believe but here's what happened love happened all over the place sacrificial extravagant love just happened everywhere right the last emperor before Constantine you might have heard of him guy named Diocletian just a horrible horrible guy Uh, he was doing okay he wasn't making a whole lot of trouble near the very end of his reign he decided for some reason that he didn't he was just going to do away with the Christians so he launched the worst persecution of Christians in the known world up to that time I mean there were hundreds there were thousands of them murdered crucified and it was his stated goal he was going to wipe out the way It was his opinion that these people, these Christians, weren't praying to all the right gods. They were only praying to their God, and he was making all the other gods mad. So they're the problem of Rome. Rome is falling because of the Christians, because they're not doing due diligence. They're not worshiping all of our gods. So just wipe them out entirely. And it was brutal. The worst the world had ever seen up to that point. And here's the key, though. His aim to wipe out Christians, that entirely failed completely. Why? those very character traits that I just now showed you. For the first 250 years, Christianity developed. There was no emperor telling you that you had to be a Christian. In fact, the emperor was killing you if you were a Christian. And you ask yourself, well, how in the world did the faith grow to the point where the emperor says, hey, (laughs) it's here, everyone's a Christian, so I'm just going to make it okay. What happened? I'll tell you what happened. It was people being merciful and poor in spirit and generous and gracious That's what happened. (laughs) Love happened all over the place. And again, at this point, I'm I'm thinking, you know, as I'm, I'm looking at this, Matthew is recording what Jesus had said. And I'm thinking either Matthew or Jesus thinking, you know what, I, the, the troops are kind of down, this, this whole poor in spirit, I'm going to have to give them some other word pictures. So Jesus gives us two just amazingly, they, they're like lift you up, right? If you feel after reading the Beatitudes, poor in spirit and meek and downtrodden and persecuted, and you're just kind of like, oh, wow, man, being a Christian, what a load. Jesus is like, you know what, look up. <laughs> lift up, I'm going to tell you two things that you are. When you explain, or excuse me, when you display these characteristics, you become two things. And they're the two things that changed the world. Two things. You are two things. Here's the first thing. Matthew chapter 5, verse 13. You are the salt of the earth. You guys are aware of that, right? You're the salt of the earth. In fact, in this phrase, Jesus kind of provided us with the greatest compliment that you can give somebody, right? When you, when you know somebody who's just solid, right? They're faithful. You know they're going to work. I mean, they're just the salt of the earth. Right? That, that, that's, that doesn't get any better than that. The salt of the earth. Um, to the ancient world, salt stood for basically three things. I'm going to go very quickly on this one. Salt stood for purity. Right? And you can imagine it's the, the, the brilliant white. Uh, to the Romans, they considered it so pure because it came from the two purest things in their world, the, the sun and the sea. Make salt. And so that was like pure times pure equals way pure. Right? And it flavors food. We all know this. It flavors food. But the one I really want to focus on this morning is that last one. It preserves. It stops decomposition. Get ready for this. It stops putrefaction. So you're thinking, why did I come to church today? To understand what putrefaction means. Stops decomposing, decomposition, putrefaction due to chemical and bacterial action. Yes, yeah, so you can go home and say, hey, I learned something today. Now, we're going to come back to those first two in a bit, but I want to drive here at at what the overriding picture of Jesus is when he gives this metaphor is that you are the preservatives of the earth. You, followers of Jesus Christ, are the preservatives of the earth. Do you ever think about yourselves like that? You think about, oh, I'm salt. You know, I taste, you know, make people taste good because I'm my fine tasting. I don't know. That all got weird. But preservative, right? The preservatives of the world. Listen, ancient world virtues. Listen to this. Power, right? Might makes right. Right? The emperor can do anything he wants. That, th- these were the virtues of the ancient world. There were no moral and ethical issues. Right? Do you understand that? There was just simply what the prince wanted. 
Whatever the ruler wanted, that was your moral or ethical issue. There were no other concerns. It's what the emperor wanted, the emperor got. Just the way it worked. Mercy and grace and compassion and generosity, those were the traits of weak people. And I'm going to say this very carefully. In the context of 2,000 years ago, these were the traits of women and children. And women and children had no rights. Do you see how everything's connecting up in that worldview? Mercy, grace, generosity, compassion, these are what weak people display. If you're strong, you take what you want because you're strong. Again, much of what we assume to be common courtesy, common decency in our world today isn't common at all. It's learned. We're in a culture that has learned that we were created in the image of a loving God and therefore that every single one of us has value. That is something our culture has learned. Other cultures in the world have not learned that. And the individual has no value. You were not created in the image of the king. You were just a biological accident. And biological accidents can die, and it's not that big a deal. Because that's just a biological accident. But we have a worldview that's radically different than the rest of the world. You are the preservatives of the earth. Human trafficking, you read about it, all ages... Male and female, child, adult, sexploitation, the porn industry. You look at the world and you think, how? How could they treat each other like that? It's because they don't have the same worldview that you have. They don't believe that they were created in the image of a loving God. They consider themselves accidents of biology. It's easy to get discouraged and to draw back. Jesus has a name for this. It's, it's called losing your salt. Watch this. Verse 13, it says, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. So if Christians aren't about the business of preserving, then the earth rots. Have you ever thought about that? If we aren't about the business of preserving and flavoring the life of the people, the world around us, then the world around us decomposes, it rots, it putrefies. So we can stay in here all day Sunday and we can be holy in our own homes and we can, you know, go to church, read our Bibles and do all the spiritual disciplines. But if that doesn't make a difference and impact in the rest of the world, then the rest of the world rots and decomposes while we sit in here and sing holy tunes. We have been called to so much more than this. This is just the start. This is where we get healed. This is where we get empowered. This is where we get filled with the Spirit. And then we go out and do the real business. If we draw back, if we quit from our task of preserving, then we will see just how bad the world can be. And you're seeing that in parts of the world, they're actually going backwards. They were once a little bit more in advance, but now they, and because of their religious convictions, are going backwards into just a brutal, brutal, brutal time. See, but when we lean into our task, the craziest things happen. This is, this is a guy named uh, Plutarch. He's a, he's a Roman historian. He, he wrote biographies about a bunch of the big Roman people. And he says this about salt. I love this. This is kind of the image I want to leave you with, and then I want to jump to light. Salt is like a new soul inserted into a dead body. Okay? Think about that for a moment. Plutarch said that, that, a, that a piece of a meat, or, or, yeah, a piece of meat is a dead body. Right? Or it's part of a, it was part of a dead body. Now, if I jump down there and I kill Dan right now, you're not going to start smelling him. Well, you showered this way. Good, 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 good. So he's going to smell fine for at least a day or two. All right? So just because he's dead doesn't mean he's suddenly putrid. Y'all got that. So this was his opinion. This is the opinion of Plutarch. He says, he says that meat is a dead body, part of a dead body, and will, if left to itself, it will eventually go bad and begin to stink. But salt preserves it and keeps it fresh and is therefore like a new soul inserted into a dead body. I love that imagery. It's like really, really gross, but it's really, really accurate, right? When we do loving acts, we give dead bodies new souls to the point where they they come back to life. Through our sacrificial, extravagant acts of life, dead bodies come back to life. 
All right, so the disciples, like, they, they, made, the, they made the connections, right? Purity, flavoring, preserving of life, right? Hit that next slide there. Christian, Christianity is to life what salt is to food, right? Christianity lends flavor to life. In other words, the good deeds, being merciful, being gracious, being forgiven, being forgiving, of a pure and righteous life simply makes life taste better. But here's the problem. The fact remains that death will come to everything and everybody, no matter how much salt you add. When we first got married, she's not in the room. She made a batch of spaghetti in a crock pot, and she admits that no amount of salt in the world could bring that spaghetti back to life. And her poor brother came over, and we both got distracted, and he ate the whole thing. <laughs> That's another story entirely. Sidetracked. Here we go. No matter how much salt you, and this is why the second word picture that Jesus paints is so, so incredibly vital, right? You are the salt of the earth, but you are so much more than just the salt of the earth. So Jesus continues with that second, really encouraging, uplifting, right? You're the salt of the earth. Well, guess what else you are? You are the light of the world. Now, this was a huge compliment because who, did, who said that he was the light of the world? John chapter 9, verse 5 says, I, while I am in the world, I am the light of the world. The implication being when I leave, you're going to be the light of the world. You're going to reflect my light. I reflected my Father's light. You're going to reflect my light. You are the light of the world. Then he says this, here, a town built on a hill cannot be hidden. And again, we, we use that English term, a lot of people aren't thrilled with this, but a town, and really the better word was placed, deliberately and intention, intentionally, strategically placed on a hill. A lot of parts of the world you have hamlets and you have towns inside valleys somewhat kind of hidden, but in this part of the world every town that was built was built on it. They wanted it needed to be seen. It was well lit up on the hill, whitewashed white so the sun set. I mean, you cannot miss the towns in ancient Israel. They were meant to be seen. They were not meant to be hidden. That was absolutely crucial. Now here's the the, the big for you guys. Here's the, the takeaway. <clears throat> Not only are you the preservatives of the earth, you're also like a strategically placed town. Every single one of you here has been strategically placed. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you have been placed in this place right here. Now, you might be thinking, oh, no, 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 man, I, I just transferred here from Toledo and... You know, as soon as this job's over, I'm going back to Toledo. This wind is driving me crazy. You, I don't know how you all live out here. No, no, Jesus says, no, 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 you're here for a reason. Oh, no, 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 I was only here because my girlfriend moved out here and she told me to come on out here and now she's sleeping with my boss and that the whole thing blew up. And as soon as I get some money, I'm going back home. And Jesus says, no, you're here for a reason. You have been intentionally, strategically placed in a way that you cannot be hidden. So stop trying. <laughs> God deliberately placed you here, and you're thinking the whole time, oh, no, I don't want anyone to know I'm here. I'm not telling anybody I'm here because I want to go back home. And Jesus is saying, no, I need you here. I put you here for a reason. Now go be salt to everyone around you. I've placed you here for a reason. Jesus continues in 15, neither do people put a lamp and put it, neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand. And it gives light to everyone in the house. Now, you're catching the phraseology here. In the same way that a town is placed on a hill so that it can't be hidden, in the same way that a lamp is placed on a lampstand so that everybody can see it, in the same way, verse 15, excuse me, verse 16, in the same way... Let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Listen, this idea that we're supposed to be doing all of our good deeds in, in hiddenness is, is a little bit of a misunderstanding. Um, earlier in the Beatitudes, you know, he talks about being humble and not doing things, you know, for glory and everything. This is not for your glory. You're not doing good things for your glory. This is for God's glory, right? So a lot of you will go, whoa, 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 wait a minute. I'm supposed to do these things in secret. No, this passage makes it very, very clear. You are a town on a hill that should not be hidden. You're like a lampstand. Put up on the lampstand so that everybody can see the light. Stop trying to hide your good deeds. 
I know you're trying to think that you're holy and, and all that, but Christ said, no, let people know why you're doing these things. Why? So they'll glorify my Father in heaven. You're thinking, oh, no, people will glorify me, and I don't want that. No, if you go about it right, they're going to glorify your, your Father in heaven, especially if you tell them why you're doing it, and they know that you're a follower of Jesus Christ and that he died for you and that he wants you to have eternal life too. They're going to get it. They're going to get it. I am the light, now you're the light. In verse 16, in the same way, let your light shine. Now, two important things here. I want to talk about your light and the good deeds, or excuse me, to see and our good deeds. I want to start with the good deeds. Two words that we can use for good deeds here in the, in the, in the Greek, and, the, and we kind of miss it. Um, there is a word, agathos, with good in quality, good floor, good solid floor, right? I'm not going to fall through it. It's not a ceiling. It's a floor. Would you agree this is a solid floor, good floor, right? That's one word. That's not the word that Matthew used. He used kalos, meaning winsome and beautiful and attractive, you get the point? It's like, do good deeds, but he's literally calling us to do good deeds that um, the people, like, whoa, what, what? They don't go, oh, oh, what, when you're a good chair, you're just a chair. Oh, no, you're amazing, amazing chair, right? A lot of the world looks at Christians, oh, they're, they're just a Christian, but there are certain Christians. <laughs> And they look at them and they're, man, they, they do crazy things. They draw, they're like honey. They draw, they draw people in. The good deeds must not only be good, but they gotta be attractive. And again, the tragedy of our, as I read on Facebook, social media, and so forth, we, we've got a, a truth being put out there that's so cold and so austere and so rigid that it's, it's not good. It, it, there, there's a goodness that's beautiful and there's a goodness that can be not beautiful. And I think that when we get into our arguments, we're offering what we feel is good, but it's really not. It's ugly, it's cold, it's hurtful. But we want to be right. No, you want to be holy. That's your goal, to be holy, not right. And here's the other thing about the good deeds being seen. Our good deeds ought to draw attention not to ourselves, but to God. Not only is light meant to be seen, but it's also a guide to show the way. Light is sometimes used to clear the way, to make the path clear. And so then that is the Christian's job. That is what we are called to do. Live extravagant, loving, sacrificial, just like 2,000 years ago. The early church took these words very seriously. You can see in this picture, hit that last slide, um, around the outside of the arena, those are, those are crosses, those are people on fire. I mean, this wasn't a photograph, this was an artistic rendering. Um, and the rest of the world, they looked at this, and they looked at it, and they looked at all these persecutions, and they finally, by the time a Diocletian came around, they said, no, stop, stop. We can't do this. We cannot participate in what you're doing any longer. Literally, what happened with Diocletian, the people stopped supporting him. They looked at the Christians, and they, they just couldn't figure them out, right? When there was something bad happened, when, when the people would leave their babies down by the river, guess who went down to the river and collected up those babies, brought them home, and raised them as themselves? Everybody knew that the Christians were doing that. They were going down at night and picking up abandoned babies, when the plague hit the cities, all the other people left, all the other priests of all the other religions flew. They were gone. Guess who stayed and died next to the sick people? The world took note of this. They watched this and they said, Diocletian, no, stop. Stop. This is the way we want to live. And the very next emperor, Constantine, well, dig into your history books, you know what happened. In many parts of the world, they have to take their faith this seriously. My um, younger sister and her husband are missionaries in Mozambique. And she was telling me on the phone a couple weeks ago that he had gotten out of his car and he was loading it up with stuff and they're, they're uh, missionaries for the Assemblies of God. And they build tabernacles. That's what they do. Like one a week. That's just, that's all they do. And he said he, he was putting some stuff in his car and as he grabbed the door handle, he could look in the, in, in the side mirror and he could see two guys almost 
very quickly, quick stepping, coming up to him and he glanced up and there were two more people coming down the street and he knew instantly I'm about to get jacked. Jumped in his car, locked the car, and immediately the both, the, the, on both sides of the cars, these guys started banging on the windows, trying to break the windows. He put it into first and, and got on out of there. He said that, as they explained this to me, he said, this is the way it is here. Every single property has a wall around it with concertina wire around the top or broken glass. And every business, every, you, most homes, you pay an armed guard to watch your house. Like, I got a key and a lock for my house. I don't know, any of you? Like, a little key? Lock? Oh, I'm safe. In many parts of the world, they take their faith very, very seriously. And to be involved in the activities that Toby and Melinda are being involved in is very, very dangerous. There will be Christians being killed for doing this. And again, we're, we're in a culture that has bought into all this already. But the people outside these doors, they don't, they don't know that. You are the salt of the earth and the light of the world. You have been strategically placed like a light to carry out strategic acts of sacrificial love, salt, that will glorify God and draw people to him, light. You are salt and you are light. Would you bow your heads? Father, thank you. Thank you for these beautiful descriptions that we are so incredibly special to you and you have bestowed upon us such dignity because we were made in your image and you care so deeply about us and love us so deeply. Um, Father, the world needs to hear this message. Thank you, Father, that you have called us and he equipped us to be salt and light. And when our character reflects the Beatitudes, then we are salt and light to the world. Thank you, Father. Your son's name I pray. Amen.